Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Director of Research and Development at the Institute for the Future and author of New York Times bestseller, Reality is Broken, Jane McGonigal. Hey. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be able to kick off this fabulous festival this year. We are going to do something new and different. It's very crazy. I'm a little bit nervous. Um, I'm going to do uh, a talk I've never done before and will never do again. This is the one time this talk will exist. Um, and what I want to do with you today is to take a look at some award-winning games from the year 2024. So I'm here today in my official capacity from the Institute for the Future. As some of you may have know, I've been working with IFTF for about seven and a half years now. IFTF is a nonprofit research group based in Palo Alto, California, um, the oldest future forecasting organization in the world. It's been around for about 45 years. And we are focused on helping individuals and organizations figure out how to imagine all of the possible futures, figure out which futures are plausible, and then figure out which ones we want so we can make the future happens. So we don't predict the future. This is uh, what you see in our offices. Um, instead of trying to see the future, we're going to actively make the future we want. And I want to help all of you learn how we work at IFTF because every game for change is really uh, a way of making the future, right? If you're trying to make a change in the world, you are imagining a future that is different from today. And then the game is designed to help you get to that different future. So I want to share with you one of our core methodologies at IFTF, and I'm gonna demonstrate that methodology for you in a kind of scary, improvisational, performance-style approach um, that I hope will teach you the method well enough that you can use it um, the rest of the week here at the festival to help you imagine the future you want to make. Uh, so I think that's everything I need to tell you before we start. Um, so the methodology that I'm gonna teach you is uh, the signals process. So the signals process means looking for signals from the future. So what is a signal from the future? Well, a signal from the future is something you can see today. Uh, you might be familiar with the quote from the science fiction writer, William Gibson. He said, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So we're looking for signs of what the future might be like in the present moment. We're looking for things that catch our attention, that seem weird, that, that we've never seen before. Um, and if it piques your curiosity, it, it might just be a signal from the future. And um, I discovered a signal from the future all the way back in the year 2001 uh, that changed my life. This is probably the most important signal from the future I ever encountered. Um, I was uh, in my first year at UC Berkeley doing my PhD work, and I was there to study not games, but to study how physicists collaborate with each other and how they communicate science to the public. That was what I was supposed to do with my research. Um, and, and something unusual happened that year that changed my focus. And I, I discovered this signal. Earlier that year, in 2001, um, it was the first alternate reality game ever conducted at scale. It was called The Beast. It was for Steven Spielberg's movie, Artificial Intelligence. And there were all of these players from all over the world playing collectively and collaboratively online. And they formed this kind of real artificial intelligence made up of human beings connected, solving puzzles together. And that was in the first part of 2001. On September 11th that year, many of the players returned to the discussion forums for that game, wondering if they could use their collective intelligence skills to help in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And they started arguing back and forth, you know, we're the greatest puzzle solving collective ever assembled. We have this amazing artificial intelligence that we are, we can do this investigation. Um, we should use our powers for good. And other people were worried, this is blurring the line between reality and games, and this is kind of crazy. Um, and they had this amazing discussion trying to figure out how they could use their real world um, use their game skills in the real world. This is the first time I saw anything like that. Um, and it captured my curiosity so much. Um, what was this a signal of? I think it was a signal of two things. It was a signal possibly that some percentage of gamers might like to apply their gaming skills to solve real world problems. It was the first time that I ever saw that. Um, and it was also a signal of this idea of artificial intelligence created by humans. This was before crowdsourcing was a term. This was before Wikipedia existed, um, although these players were using wikis to solve their puzzles. 
So it was a signal of two interesting things, gamers trying to solve real world problems and, and maybe the rise of some kind of mass collaboration on computer networks that didn't have a name for it yet. We didn't know it was gonna be called crowdsourcing. Um, but that changed the course of my life in research because I switched my PhD topic to study could gamers you know, save the real world. So uh, it just goes to show that paying attention to signals can uh, really impact the course of, of your work and your research and your, and your life. Um, now, signals, I want you to kind of go with me on a little metaphorical journey here. Um, signals are like jelly beans. Um, so how many of you guys have ever tried to make a recipe out of the jelly belly jelly beans? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, so for example, if you have two green apple jelly beans and a cinnamon jelly bean, and you put them in your mouth at the same time, that supposedly makes a, one of those um, candy apples, or if you can get six jelly beans in your mouth at one time, uh, banana, put chocolate pudding, crushed pineapple, strawberry jam, very cherry and French vanilla, supposedly it tastes like a banana split in your mouth. Um, so you have to collect all the jelly beans and then you eat them and you see what they taste like. So the signals process is a little bit like this. You can collect lots of different signals and then put them together and see what that future tastes like. So you look for lots of different interesting things and then you combine them and see what world that suggests. A world in which all five of these signals get amplified and come to be more of a, a dominant theme or, or a pervasive technology. Um, and we do this at Institute for the Future all the time. One of our uh, favorite ways to collect signals and interesting combinations is our 10-year forecast. So you can go online and you know, Google 10-year forecast, and you can read all of these 10-year forecasts uh, from years past. Um, we do this every year, and we, we turn them into a map where you can look at interesting signals. Um, a recent 10-year uh, forecast had really cool signals like earth scrapers. So these are skyscrapers that are built into the ground. So they down into the earth, um, and lightning packs. So these are, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen these. These are mobile devices powered by your footsteps. So these, like, things really exist, and you start to combine them in interesting ways, and you imagine a different future for the world. Um, and thinking about 10 years out in the future can be really useful in unexpected ways, even for your creative practice. I thought I would share with you uh, something I, I don't think I've really talked about or written about this anywhere, but it's how 10-year uh, forecasting has affected my creative work uh, and my game design work. So in 2008, we ran a game at the Institute for the Future called Superstruct, and it was the first time we opened up our 10-year forecast to the public. We invited um, ordinary people to look at our signals and combine them and tell stories about the future. And the theme of this experience, this kind of creative game space, was um, we asked you to imagine that whatever you are good at, whatever you do for a living or what you know a lot about or community that you organize, that your community was gonna be essential or your skill was gonna be essential for solving a ginormous problem in the future. And we had five problems we were looking at. One of the problems um, was, uh, we called it quarantine, and it had to do with a fictional uh, pandemic, something like SARS, but slightly less deadly. Instead of killing you, it would leave you incapacitated for the rest of your life with a chronic respiratory illness called uh, respiratory distress syndrome. And, uh, and that was one of the areas that we asked people to imagine, how could you use your super skill, your superpower, to solve this problem? Well, as a game designer, when I participated in Superstruct, I thought that game designers might actually be kind of heroes in the world of the quarantine, because if we could get people to stay at home um, in their own living rooms or bedrooms and play video games, they would not go out in public and be exposed to um, this pandemic. And I thought, great, video gamers, like finally this idea of somebody alone in their basement playing a video game will be like this heroic image for how to stay alive in this future. Um, so I actually started to imagine what kind of game I would make for this world. And I learned from, you know, other players, there are players from the CDC who are teaching me about quarantines, and one of the hardest things to do is to stop people socializing, that even during a pandemic, people want to go out and, and socialize. They want to go to uh, movies and sports events and dance clubs. So I decided maybe uh, Connect, I think, was just coming out then, and I was thinking maybe I'll make some kind of a, a dancing game where you can have a, like a nightclub in your living room and connect you with dancers around the world. We'll stop people from going to nightclubs and getting pandemic. So in this game, I imagine that that's what I would do 10 years in the future. Um, well, about four months after 
this experiment ended, I actually made a game called Top Secret Dance Off, which um, if you've read my book, you've read about this, um, although I don't think I explained the pandemic origins of it. Um, and Top Secret Dance Off is a game in which you dance in your living room um, and you wear a disguise uh, so that you're not embarrassed that you're a bad dancer. Um, I designed it that way because I was embarrassed by my dancing. Um, and I have a little video. This is a, this was sort of a weird experimental project. We don't have a lot of great documentation of it. So I'm going to show you a kind of grainy video, just so you can get a sense of uh, what a pandemic-inspired, fictional pandemic-inspired video game uh, would look like. One of the ideas behind this game is that you would post these videos of you dancing, and these are sort of dance-off quests like dance without moving your feet or dance upside down, and other players would help you level up in these dance skills like courage and creativity, and uh, I think we had uh, awesomeness was a very important thing to level up in. Um, and I just wanted to try this out because I was curious. There was no sponsor reason to do this. Um, so I built it on the social network Ming, um, and I had a developer. Um, and we created the first game mechanics on the Ning social network system so that we could have people track these plus ones and you could actually award plus ones to other players. Um, so that was, like a, that was a fun project. Um, and where that project led, surprisingly, was to a very different project that I did for the World Bank Institute um, called Evoke, where as kind of at the last minute, they decided they wanted to do this online course to teach social entrepreneurship, and they weren't sure how many players they were gonna enroll. Um, we, we made this game, and we were trying, we were hoping for like 500 players, um, and we wound up enrolling 20,000 um, in our first run. And I couldn't have run this game if I hadn't already developed that back end where players could give each other plus one, so we were able to actually have the players be the peer evaluators of the Evoke players' coursework. It was an online course. You were completing these educational quests. And so we used exactly the same code from Top Secret Dance Off to run Evoke. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and, and then we were able to run you know, this huge, massively online open course before we knew what that term meant. Um, and then it won an award at Games for Change. So the moral of the story is that by thinking about weird futures that are 10 years out, it may help you do something creative today that may turn into a really important innovation for a serious project that you're working on that may lead you to all win a Game for Change award in the next couple of years. Um, so that's my goal today, is to get you ready for that. Um, we're gonna look at a lot of signals together. I think I've about 25 or 30 signals in this talk. I'm gonna combine them in weird ways. You might have other ways that you would combine them. So um, you know, think about that. I'm gonna be ignoring some signals. So uh, forecasting the future, um, it's very dependent on your expertise and your perspective. So that's why at the Institute for the Future, we, we try to bring a really diverse group of people together whenever we're doing forecasts with people from different fields, from different countries, from uh, different, uh, every, uh, different you know, viewpoints. Um, because you will naturally be attracted to signals that, that reflect your, your skills and your interests. Um, so here are some of the signals I'm not going to be looking at that other people doing a forecast of the future of games would probably be really interested in. So j that's just a disclaimer. Um, I'm not looking at drones, although I think drones and robots will be important for the future of games. I'm not looking at virtual currencies, although I think virtual currencies will be very important for the future of games. I'm not going to be looking at the sort of neurological hacks where you can use your brain waves to control games. I think it's really important, but I'm not looking at it. And, and I'm not looking really at augmented reality. Um, that's not what I'm looking at today. Um, the other uh, sort of, so we're not doing any of that. Um, the other disclaimer is, um, so I'm sharing with you the five award-winning games from the year 2024. And in my imagination, Games for Change by then is so global that we all have our own sort of national awards, kind of like the Academy Awards are for US-made films. Um, I'm imagining that uh, these are all games made in the United States. And the reason is, um, Good future forecasts are based on what you know, and I know the United States better than I know other parts of the world. So all of these are situated in the context of the United States. So are you guys ready to go into the future with me? Yes, here we go. All right, welcome to the 15th annual Games for Change Awards. Um, I am pleased to announce the nominees. Please hold your applause uh, until the end. The 2024 nominees are 
ever win by the California State Lottery and Gambling Association. <laughs> Magical Mystery Diner for Steam Real 3D and the HP Fujet Home Printer. <laughs> Walk My Mile by Facebook Games for the Oculus Rift. Mega NFL, the 2023 to 2024 season by Nike Plus. And finally, Socrates 2.0 by the Institute for the Future, because of course, in my future, my organization is totally making award-winning games. All right, so let's take a look at these nominees. Um, and I'm gonna share with you the signals that inspired the idea. These are kind of half-baked ideas, and some of them, I think will make you angry or scared of the future, but that's the way uh, future forecasts work. We try to be provocative. Um, so here's some signals that inspired the idea for Everwin by the California State Lottery and Gambling Commission. Um, so how many of you have, have heard of these save to win lottery linked savings accounts? Anyone? I think this is a really important signal of the future. So um, these are widespread around the world and increasingly popular in the United States. These are savings accounts that every time you make a deposit, you are entered into a lottery where you can win money. Um, and the idea here is to try to incentivize people who have not really been active in financial planning to try to become uh, more involved and set up a savings account and that maybe they'll be motivated by the chance to win some money to actually put some money in their accounts. And these are, these are pretty widespread. Um, another signal that influenced this forecast um, is research into dopamine priming. So one of the things we know about motivation is that we're more motivated by things that are really close to us in the present than things in the future. So it can be hard to motivate people to save money for you know, retirement or a, a disaster in the future when you know, the shoes or the TV are so salient and present in the moment. Um, and so they, the reward of the present overwhelms the reward of the future. Um, but if you can get somebody to be anticipating a reward right now, maybe like winning 50 bucks uh, like on a lottery ticket, if you can anticipate that right now, it will motivate you to do something that otherwise wouldn't feel salient in the present. So that's dopamine priming. It's kind of an interesting area of research. Um, and the last signal that influenced this forecast is the rise of social gambling. Um, there's been some legislation in the United States to kind of slow this process down. Um, but everywhere I look now, game conferences have this you know, extra track of social gambling and online gambling. And um, I'm pretty convinced that this is gonna be a thing and there's gonna be a lot of money made here, whether it's made legally through the United States or not. Um, something that we'll be looking at, um, apps and, and online environments for, for gambling and casino style games. Okay, so this is how we do the jelly bean combination. When you add up uh, savings uh, account lotteries, with dopamine priming, with social gambling, what do you get? Well, you get Everwin or gambling for change. So something to think about here, a provocative future where we won't just be games for change, but we'll be gambling for change. Um, and the idea here is that maybe, you know, economists who notice that there's uh, almost perfect correlation with the amount of lottery tickets that are bought with the areas of the United States that have the highest income inequality. And we start to think about how individuals in today's um, economy um, are, uh, feel there's no way to get ahead um, other than to play the lottery and put their money into that sort of one in a billion chance success because the actual economy feels so rigged against them as a game. Um, perhaps we will start to use lotteries uh, to address that economic inequality. So I can imagine a future in which companies that want to run online gambling, uh, such as online poker, online blackjack, must uh, legally have an additional element, which are lotteries and slot machines, um, online or on app, of course, where all of the money that you play goes into a savings account. So if you can imagine like walking into a casino where all of the money that you're betting is going right into your savings account when you lose it, um, that is a future that I could imagine for the luck-based games only. Skill-based games, they can still take your money, but for the luck-based games, it becomes kind of a loss leader for these companies, and it's how the California state law will make legal um, these social gambling apps in, in the future. So there you go, that is Everwin, uh, a, a possible game from the future. Um, and that was an image of it. Okay, so nominee number two, Magical Mystery Diner for Steam Real 3D and the HP Fujet Home Printer. Here are some signals that I was thinking about. You guys have seen the 3D printers that make food, right? Um, they can make food that looks like things we've never seen before, right? Because they, you know, there's cornstarch and proteins and they, you design it and it prints out these incredible looking things that don't look like anything you've eaten before. So that's interesting. You can look at personalized nutrition at home. Another signal 
Um, this is work actually being done at the Institute for the Future. Um, one of our designers there, um, Alex Goldman, is uh, doing an investigation into how Oculus Rift changes taste perception. So he actually did an experiment last week where he was able to convince people um, that they were eating an orange when they were in fact eating a grapefruit just by providing sensory input in the world uh, that they were eating an orange. Um, so this is interesting. We can change what people think they're eating when they have the Oculus Rift on. Okay, so um, how about the Stanford uh, Research Project, uh, the kind of cow simulator, have you guys seen this? Um, you crawl around on the floor and it's this really immersive world where you are a cow. Um, and they found that people who uh, did this for a couple minutes ate 25% uh, less meat in the next week. Interesting, okay, because maybe you have empathy for the cow because you've done this simulator. Okay, so we add up uh, at-home food printers with um, Oculus Rift changes your taste perception with cow simulators that inspire you to eat less meat and, and what kind of games for change future can we imagine? Maybe games for mealtime. So we know one of the biggest problems we have in, in terms of environmental sustainability is the consumption of meat is, uh, has a quite a high carbon impact cost and we, we see things like this where, uh, you know, um, is my cheeseburger causing global warming? Um, by the way, this is low carbon diet day, like actually today, April 22nd, um, if you would like to eat less carbon you know, impact uh, foods, give up the cheeseburger and have a plant burger or something. Um, so what if we had games in the future? This is where we get a little, I don't know, is this dystopian or utopian? You decide, depends on how much you like your cheeseburger, I guess, where um, you are gonna be playing a game and uh, eating food out of your 3D printer that is not meat, and uh, maybe it tastes good because you've got an Oculus Rift telling you that you're eating this amazing food and it'll have a lower carbon impact because it's just the stuff you printed out from your computer. Um, and by the way, uh, this guy, you should follow him on Twitter. I tweeted this weekend on a plane. Could somebody please um, take a photo of themselves eating dry cereal while wearing an Oculus Rift? Um, it's very hard to take a selfie with the Oculus Rift on. Uh, so I promised him that I would, he's a game designer, so you should follow him, okay. Great, so uh, that's a possibility for the future. Okay, nominee number three, Walk My Mile by Facebook Games for the Oculus Rift. Um, here's some signals that influence me. There's a great project called StoryCorps that um, sets up these physical uh, installations around the country and you come with somebody you know in your life and you interview them, like as if you were doing an NPR story. You bring someone that you would like to document their story and people bring you know, their parents or they bring friends or neighbors and uh, it's a really beautiful project where you can record somebody's story and, and make their voice be heard. And I, and I love the sort of intimacy, kind of two player nature of this experience. Um, hey, Facebook bought Oculus Rift, um, enough said. That's an important signal for the future. Um, Stanford uh, Human Virtual Interaction Research Lab has been prototyping empathy building VR games. So um, they've found, for example, that if you um, play a VR game where it simulates color blindness, you are more likely in real life to volunteer to help with efforts to, uh, to, to spread awareness about color blindness and how to meet, uh, you know, if you're making games, that's something interesting to know about. You'd actually be able to volunteer more in real life after experiencing what it's like to have color blindness. So they're very interested in how can having a virtual reality experience make us have more empathy for people who are unlike us. So that's an important signal. Um, another signal, uh, a project called Global Lives. If you haven't seen this, you should check it out, especially if you're interested in film. This is a global film project where they record 24 hours in the life of somebody who is uh, demographically, statistically uh, significant um, in different parts of the world. So, um, and you can see it's like a very diverse group. They go all over the world and you can just literally watch 24 hours in their life. And what is it like to be a man living in, uh, in Bangkok who runs a, a shop, right? Um, and it's, it's a wonderful uh, empathy building project as well. Um, we've seen in the game industry the explosion of audio, autobiographical indie games, people using games as a medium to tell their own life story. Um, Twine has been important for that. Um, we've just seen uh, lots of really interesting games where people are now using this as a way to tell stories that we've never heard told in games before. So if you add this all up, we've got the StoryCorps project, we've got Facebook buying Oculus Rift, we've got Stanford's research on empathy in VR, we've got autobiographical games and the Global Lives project. What do you get? Well, maybe we get something like games that democratize the memoir. So I'm imagining a world in which uh, Facebook uh, allows you to connect any two people in the world, they already do that, 
So imagine a StoryCorps type project where you can interview anyone else in the world to get their life story and then you can turn it into um, a game. And then somebody else can put on their Oculus Rift headset and walk a mile in your shoes. Right? That's where the name comes from, Walk My Mile. So you can make a game for someone else or you can make your own game. And uh, we know that uh, when we have that sort of virtual reality experience, we create mirror neurons that mirror the neurons of the actual people who told the story or experienced it themselves, which we know builds empathy. So maybe we will solve the empathy gap in the future through this amazing network of memoirs and life stories that you can live a day in the life of anyone in the world uh, that would be awesome, okay. And we would totally give that an award. Okay, now as a fail break, I wanted to do a forecast about something and I couldn't think of a good game out of them. So I want you to look at these three signals and see if you can come up with something because I'm convinced there's something there. But for me, it, it was a big fail. Um, so you guys saw the world's biggest Tetris interface in Philadelphia just uh, recently. They played Tetris on the side of the building. Okay, so keep that in mind. World's build biggest Tetris interface. Um, we have in San Francisco currently the world's largest LED installation. So it's all these program lights that do interesting things, but you can't interact with it. You just kind of look at it. That's currently live in San Francisco, the world's largest LED installation. And we saw the world's largest Pokemon game um, being played on Twitch, where we had like 30,000 people were in the chat room trying to control a single game uh, character. Um, so kind of the first sort of crowdsource single player game. Um, so if you add up the world's largest Tetris interface on public buildings, the world's largest LED installation, but you can't interact with it, and all of these people controlling a single creature, I feel like you should get something. But what? I don't know. So if you would please tweet at me your ideas. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, Avant Game. If you have a good idea or tell me uh, at the rest of the festival. Okay, nominee number four, the Mega NFL, the 2023 to 2024 season by Nike Plus. Some of the signals here, um, most users we now know abandon their fitness tracker after about 90 days. Um, sorry, it's true. Um, we've seen really cool, successful projects, however, just on you know, smartphones like Zombies Run, the augmented reality game that uh, as you run through the streets, you hear zombies chasing you, which is very uh, good at motivating you to run faster. <laughs> Um, this is a project called um, Health Ball, where it was a bunch of out of shape guys who love uh, football who created a fantasy football league where your, uh, your actual you know, fantasy teams were augmented by quests you completed during the week, like exercising or going to the farmer's market. Um, and actually, I was, a, I was an advisor for Nike Plus, uh, their sort of fuel lab incubator last year, and there was a wonderful project that didn't get off the ground, but I was really excited about by a group called Incomparable, Game, Incomparable Things. And the idea was that the fuel from, uh, you know, the, the measure of how much physical activity you have from your Nike fuel band or your phone app um, would help you help your teams in your fantasy leagues. If you wanted to win in fantasy football, you'd have to like you know run more, do more push-ups to help your team. Um, but it didn't happen. Um, the other thing is you know there's the big concussion lawsuit with the NFL, and people are starting to feel weird about watching football. Um, I personally have stopped watching football um, because I feel uh, guilty and awkward about the brain damage being done, particularly as a survivor of a traumatic brain injury myself. And I feel of all the professional sports associations, the NFL is most likely for that reason to try something crazy, which is what I'm about to propose to you now. Um, if you add up people abandoning their fitness trackers, because really how long can you track your fitness before you don't care anymore, um, to augmented reality games, to fantasy sports leagues driven by your physical activity, to the NFL needs help, um, that adds up to games reinventing pro sports. So here's my crazy idea, by the way, I would really like to see this happen. In the future of professional sports, we'll start with exhibition games like the Pro Bowl when it doesn't matter, but it will become so popular that it will become part of the entire season by the year 2023 to 24. Um, so you pool with other fans of your favorite team, all of the steps that you take or the miles that you run, and then you can buy and auction power-ups for your favorite team in real games. So if you want the 49ers to have an extra down in the fourth quarter, you and all the 49ers fans have to run like a million miles between the Sunday games, and then you can buy that and spring that on the other team you know, haha, giants, we have an extra down. And I can imagine this working across all sorts of sports. My husband suggested, for example, that somebody might be able to grease a baseball uh, or, or bat with a cork bat. Um, wouldn't you like to buy that for your favorite team? So imagine a future in which, instead of just sitting around and cheering for our favorite teams, we're actually physically active and physically empowering our favorite teams. Um, I said you might hate some of these futures. Maybe you hate that one, but I'm really behind this one. 
Um, so the last nominee I want to share with you, um, Socrates 2.0 by the Institute for the Future. Here are our signals. Um, a lot of people right now are, are questioning um, the return on investment for a college education. It's very expensive. People are going into a lot of debt. We're starting to see even economists question if this is a good investment. Um, we're seeing a lot of for-profit colleges um, that are driving student loan defaults sort of rise. Um, one, one in 10 students go to for-profit colleges, but they account for half of all of, of defaults. And uh, there's that certainly a, a, a style of student, a type of student who's not being met successfully by today's higher education, and a lot of them are, are having trouble right now with for-profit schools. Um, we see the rise, of course, of massively open online courses where people are learning in these untraditional environments online. Um, we've seen widespread gamification in the classroom through things like uh, achievement badges and uh, quest-driven learning. Um, and then my favorite signal, uh, which I've been following for a while, is this idea of social jet lag in the classroom. So most high school students have a biological clock. That means they shouldn't um, be awake until 8 in the morning, and they shouldn't really start thinking until 9 in the morning. Um, and schools that shift their start time to 9 or 9.30 see the average GPA of students go up a full letter grade. So all the B students are A students, the C students are B students, and that's just because they're awake and thinking at the right time and getting the right amount of sleep. So if you add up uh, people wondering if college is worth it, people going to default with college programs that aren't working for them, um, MOOCs are rising, gamification is rising, and we've got to address this issue of uh, social jet lag. Um, what does it add up to? It adds up to possibly games for a future without college. And this is actually a pretty full-fledged forecast that some of my colleagues at the Institute for the Future came up with. So I'm going to show you a video now um, that will just give you uh, a glimpse when you take these signals a little bit further and imagine how they play out, um, how you can see uh, a future. Meet Andy, though you probably already know someone like him. Dreamt of being an architect since seeing the Guggenheim as a kid. Got accepted into a good architecture program at college. And then, something just didn't click. Maybe it was the crowded lectures, or irrelevant exams, or professors who never remembered his name. But Andy was lost on his own. By the time he dropped out to work at the burger barn, Andy's dream of being an architect seemed lost. But what if Andy's life followed the same path, only now, a few years in the future? Would dropping out of college still be the end of the road? Let's drop into a day in this Andy's life. Rise and shine, Andy. Whether he agrees or not, Andy's circadian body monitor knows it's the right time for him to get up. He's got 15 minutes to get out of bed and pull himself together before it's his optimal time to start studying. But studying lately has become a lot more like discovering. Last spring, Andy got a chance to try out a different route to becoming an architect. He enrolled in a new alternative to school platform called Socrates 2.0. Socrates 2.0 gives Andy lots of learning tools like this question and answer program and other learning games. It tracks his progress and the contributions he makes to the architecture community and awards him level ups when he reaches certain goals. Plus, it's all on his own schedule, so he can still work at Burger Barn to help him pay his way through. Maybe the most important thing Socrates 2.0 gives Andy is Tom, his mentor. Tom's a retired architect, one of the best in the field of urban design. I know you've been working overtime at the Burger Barn, but I checked your profile. You're still not quite getting this structural integrity stuff. There's a meetup tonight that some of the other students are going to. You may find it helpful. I'm sending it to your calendar now. In the meantime, why don't you get out of the house and take a look at some real buildings? Hmm, that's not a building you'd want to be in during an earthquake. Time to see if there are any local projects he can help out on. Andy likes to feel like he's pitching in, and the fact he can level up by contributing doesn't hurt either. Bingo. This one looks perfect. His classmate, Chiaki, could really help on the site history side, so he posts it to her profile to see if she wants to join. As usual, the room is buzzing. There's always a great mix at the meetup. Professional architects, hobbyists, scientists, academics, and students like Andy. There are plenty of people Andy would love to talk to here, but his time is limited. He's heard that Leslie Haverford was part of the Back to the Land movement in her youth. He has a hunch she'll be able to give him a fresh perspective on the relationship between nature and architecture. What can't architects learn from nature, Andy? You know who designs the best self-cooling homes? Termites! Or take our own bodies as an example. The way that muscles and cartilage provide continuous pull and the bones discontinuous push, that's like the best way to build a bridge. That's the most stable structure. 
And he's got to get home. His circadian body clock is giving him 45 minutes to get to bed. Just when things were getting good, too. The conversation with Leslie was just the kind of thing Andy wasn't getting in college. He's anxious to test out his new knowledge on Socrates 2.0, and he doesn't have a minute to spare. Andy uses his newfound inspiration to plow through as much as he can in his allotted time. Level up. And with only 10 minutes to go. Not bad, Andy. Now pat yourself on the back and enjoy those 10 minutes. It's all you've got until you have to go to bed, get up, and start all over again in the morning. Cool. Okay, so... All right, so now you've got the, the five nominees here. Um, and before we vote, because we're going to vote, um, what are some of the themes of these forecasts? You know, obviously virtual reality will be a big deal. Um, sensors will be a big deal. Augmented reality will be a big deal. Um, I, one of the ideas that I wanted to impart to you today is I think we're moving into an era where we will see big institutional interventions, games at scale, games that actively intervene to change how the world works, not so much about inspiration or persuasion um, or education, but really changing uh, the fundamentals of how we live life. That's my forecast for the future. That's my, um, my hope for the future. Um, now, before we vote, I wanted to bring you one more big news item from the year 2024. Um, some of you may have known a while ago I went on record predicting that uh, a game developer would win a Nobel Prize by the year 2023. Well, it happened one year later than I expected, but I want to offer congratulations to Alexei, the inventor of Tetris, who finally uh, received a Nobel Prize thanks to all of the peer-reviewed scientific research over the past 20 years showing that Tetris can be used to successfully uh, prevent post-traumatic stress disorder, treat chronic pain, help uh, with depression. And if you're interested in more of the science behind that, you should look at showmethescience.com, where I'm collecting some of the scientific evidence. Um, I feel that of all the games that are currently in the world today, Tetris, for the way that it helps us heal, um, has the best chance at a Nobel Prize. And so congratulations, Alexei, from 2024. All right, now we're going to end by voting. Um, so this is a real survey online. I apologize, I couldn't get a little custom one, so you're just going to have to, you know, FFJ, FFQD. Um, I want you to vote now, and I am going to analyze the results. So just to remind you, as you're pulling out your phones and get ready to vote here, we've got Everwin, or Gambling for Change, which hopefully will address some economic inequality in the future. We've got Magical Mystery Diner, which could possibly help make us uh, feel adventurous and fun about a low carbon impact diet. Um, we've got Walk My Mile, the empathy building game system for the Oculus Rift. We've got a future of pro sports that's driven by crowd participation and trying to help people become physically active and, and take control of their physical health instead of just sitting on the couch. And we've got Socrates 2.0, which is imagining a world where higher education is radically transformed and maybe you don't need a college degree in order to get mentorship and get um, hands-on experience and start contributing to solving some real world problems. So, were you guys able to find the survey? Yes, okay. I'm going to load up my results. I'll wait till I've got a good number of uh, votes here. Let's see how many we have. Hope you're voting online too since we're live casting. And come on, come on. I think we're using all of uh, Verizon's <laughs> available. <laughs> Sorry, Verizon, if we crash you. Analyzing, analyzing, okay, and the winner is Socrates 2.0. Very nice, very good. Walk My Mile was a close runner-up. Okay, so um, I want you to think of everything at Games for Change this week as a signal, every game that you see, every idea that you hear, and then combine them in interesting ways, and hopefully it will inspire you to do some amazing work. I will see you in 2024, and thank you for letting me kick off this really exciting festival. Thank you.